Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, very glad to be with you for our latest virtual program. My name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Education Department. And today we're spotlighting our virtual author series. Uh, today happens to be the eve of the 75th anniversary of the great Jackie Robinson breaking the baseball color barrier. Yeah, that it did occur 75 years ago during that historic 1947. With us to talk about Jackie is the author of a new book, True, The Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson. Our guest, Kostya Kennedy, has also written books on Pete Rose and Joe DiMaggio and has written for really a number of prestigious literary sources, Sports Illustrated, The New York Times, and The New Yorker. Our uh, first opportunity to talk to Kostya Kennedy. Kostya, welcome to the program. How have you been? I've been well. It's good uh, Good to be on with you, Bruce. I know this is a hectic time. You're doing a lot of interviews uh, today, tomorrow, maybe into next week. Who knows? Um, the timing of the book, I guess, is uh, ideal given this historic circumstance, this milestone of 75 years. So this is really a hectic time for you, is it not? Oh, you know, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to have people pay attention to the book, but also, you know, really, of course, to Jackie and to, to what he did, what he represents and what he means today. So, uh, yes, a busy time, but uh, most welcome on my part. The book is just out April of this year, so it is brand new. And anybody interested in purchasing a copy can go to our website. Uh, go to our store. It's shop.baseballhall.org forward slash true. Again, shop.baseballhall.org forward slash true. And you can get your orders in for a book that uh, not only is timely, but has been receiving a lot of critical praise and rightly so. Kostya, let's begin by talking about your motivation to write a book on Robinson. I would think kind of a daunting task because there have been a number of bios written on him, a number of very good biographies. Why did you feel motivated to try to tackle this subject, but from a different perspective? Well, no, you're right. There has been some, some good work on Robinson work that I, I very much admire. Uh, but he is a figure of, of such uh, largeness and so many layers that it was a place, uh, a place to explore. And I felt that I, I could bring a new perspective, uh, a new window into his story. Uh, and I've been thinking about it for some time. He, he's a, a person and a figure who has been, a present, been present in my life uh, throughout my professional career. Uh, about eight years ago or so, I wrote a, a story for Sports Illustrated on Rachel Robinson, his widow, and, and that probably raised the interest a little more inside uh, that I saw that there was a story there that could be found and told in a new way. So I've been kind of gathering string on it for, for some time uh, to get to this point. So about eight years you've been working on this. Well, that, that's not quite fair to say. I mean, I think that that gave me the, it, I began thinking about it. You know, I've been around baseball quite a bit. Uh, uh, I'm at MLB Network now and had a chance to speak to a lot of people over the years. So I was sort of subconsciously gathering string, as I say, but I didn't really begin on this book until a couple of years ago uh, before it came out. Did you get any sense from Rachel Robinson, Jackie's widow, uh, that uh, she would approve uh, of this type of a book and the approach you're taking? I, I believe so, you know, that, that's for her to answer. Um, I, I absolutely enormously respect her. I, I believe we have a good relationship. So I think so, yes. Uh, I certainly, you know, I spoke also specifically with Jackie's daughter, Sharon, uh, about it. And um, they certainly had, had, had no objections. And uh, I had a chance to do some work professionally with Sharon over the years too. We did events together. Uh -huh. uh, one night I moderated an event between Sharon and Branch Rickey III, which was really a, an illuminating and uh, special event. He's the grandson, of course, of Branch Rickey. So uh, he, I, I think they'd certainly be comfortable. You have picked, uh, I think, a very intriguing and a very creative way to approach the book. Rather than do a straight biography, which has been done in the past, you decided to place the emphasis on four seasons in particular. 1946, when he played in the minor leagues for the Montreal Royals. 1949, his MVP season, really a breakout campaign. 
1956, his final season, what turned out to be his final season with the Dodgers, and then 1972, the last year of his life. Um, I think it's fairly obvious why you picked those four seasons, uh, but it's interesting that you didn't pick 1947, which obviously has been talked about in great detail. Uh, you didn't pick uh, a world championship season for the Dodgers. That might have been an option. These four in particular really seem to mean a lot to you. Tell us why. Yeah, they were sort of representative of things. So, so I'll just say that these are four seasons and literally four seasons, as you just well described. They're also metaphorically the spring, summer, autumn, and winter of Robinson's public and athletic life. And I want to have an opportunity to see, you would see a, a different man in each season. Well, of course you see the same man and uh, the main title of the book, True, alludes to the sort of insistency of Robinson and the uh, determination and, and clarity of purpose that he had, but he adapted and he was the changing figure. Much of the world around him was changing. If you, if you think about when he broke in in 1946, again, he broke in in 47th, the major league, but in 1946, a year that I believe has been underreported, certainly known about, but somewhat underreported in terms of how critical it was for Robinson to be now playing essentially the only black player in an all white league for the first time, to be getting the spotlight upon him as he never had before, even with his successes as a college athlete, uh, and also to simply get better at baseball. He was a great athlete, but still a little green, a little raw around uh, around the diamond, to throw to the wrong base, make certain mistakes. He quickly got through that, a very intelligent player. But so I, I wanted to, 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 to have a chance to spotlight him in that time. By the time we see him again in 1949, he's much more of a man, man in full, even more so than he was in 1947. So a little time needed to pass for us to see a different person. Uh, and, and again, time has changed. When Jackie came in, the uh, military hadn't been integrated. By 49, it had. Uh, hmm. and we're seeing, a, we're seeing a, a new Jackie in a new environment, right? And he's not the only Black player in the league now in 1949. There's still a very, very, very few. Not a lot. The Dodgers had more than half of them, I believe, at that time. Um, but it was still very slow in coming. But still, it was a new period and a new athlete. Again, in 56, again, I, I mentioned when he came in in 1946, how early on that was, and in the civil rights movement, in the modern civil rights movement, obviously the struggle has been uh, going on since the 1600s, but Martin Luther King was 18 years old and, and uh, studying theology in, in 1946 when Jackie broke in. In 56, his last season, uh, we're in the middle of the Montgomery bus boycott. So again, mm -hmm. we see what a seismic and incredible year that was, it's a period of time uh, in American history and therefore global history. Uh, and 56, you mentioned 1955. Of course, that's a famous and incredibly important year for Dodger fans. The one year they beat the Yankees and uh, the only year they beat the Yankees in Brooklyn. Uh, it was also a very difficult year for Jackie as, as a player. It was his worst season with 1955. Uh, when, when in 1956, in that off season, the Dodgers had got in a young third baseman, Randy Jackson. They traded for him from the Cubs. Uh, it didn't, and Jackie, I should say, was playing third base in those years. It wasn't clear where Jackie would, what kind of a role Jackie would have. And he actually rebounded him a very strong season, not anything like his peak, peak years, but, uh, you know, 793 OPS, strong year, solid, big games late in the season. It was just sort of, to me, it was quite moving. It was a sort of show of will. He knew that he was at the end. Uh, he knew that his body wasn't going to take another year of this. Um, and, and he sort of rose up and performed in this way that was in, very impressive. And we also see him beginning to make the transition. He, went, he won the Spring Arn Medal that year from the NAACP, which is a medal that goes to, to an individual who is furthering the progress of, of furthering racial progress. It had never gone to an athlete ever before that. It had gone oh. to Thurgood Marshall and W.E.B. Du Bois. So we're also seeing him entering the final stage of his life He's already been in contact with Dr. King. Um, and then we go to 1972, as, as you mentioned, of course, that's the year that he died at the way too young age of 53. But it was also a very eventful year in that it was the year that Robinson kind of was repatriated into baseball. After his time of, after his retirement in 56, 
he hadn't had a job or much closeness at all in baseball. He basically hadn't been in the stadium for 15 years. Um, he wasn't estranged, uh, certainly from baseball. When he came to be inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1962, he was extremely gracious and, and very pleased to have, of, of course, that honor. But at the same time, he was dissatisfied with baseball, largely for its failure to make progress on bringing African-Americans into the managerial ranks, into the front office ranks. Uh, and it was only at Gil Hodges' funeral early in 1972, where he, where Robinson reconnected with several old Dodger teammates, including prominently Don Newcomb, that oh. began a kind of thaw with Major League Baseball and led Jackie to go out and did, did an appearance with the Dodgers on their field there. And then famously his appearance on field at the World Series just nine days before his death. So it's a very, very interesting year in which Jackie beset by the physical issues that ultimately would end his life remained sort of dogged in his in his work. He did, he did so much. He began a construction company that year in the last year of his life for low-income housing and was, uh, you know, there, there was very little quit in Jackie Robinson. You mentioned a few minutes ago the title and why you came up with it or why the publisher came up with it. Uh, true, the true nature, the sincere nature of Jackie Robinson is, is I'm guessing what you're getting at there. Um, I have some experience, though. I've written uh, some books in the past, and um, I found that many times uh, the publisher decides on the title. Uh, was that the case here, or did uh, the true idea come from you? Well, it came from my house. I had a little help from my wife, um, and we were thinking about what to what to call it um, and throwing things around, and um, we came up with true, and and it came from it came from us. Um, there was an, an idea. To, um, to to show that consistency. What 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 was it about Robinson? And so I'm sitting with my wife talking and she's saying, tell me about him. And as I talk about it, and she said, what about true? And and there we go from there. Mm. Um, so that's really that's really where it came from. And it gave it a, a way to sort of frame the consistency. I found it very apt. There's a little uh, epigraph, I'll just read it at the start of the book, um, which sort of explains it. Whatever the context and circumstances, Jackie Robinson remained true, true to his effort and the mission, true to his convictions and his contradictions. And that's an important part uh, of who Robinson was. He, he, he didn't always, you, you wouldn't have always agreed with him. I wouldn't have always agreed with him. Nobody would, because he had a certain, he, had, he thought his own way. Um, and he, we saw in his public career after baseball, he supported Richard Nixon over John F. Kennedy, but later he supported Herbert Humphrey, um, hmm. Hubert Humphrey, sorry. Um, and he he had a, he, he held to his own standards, but wasn't, he didn't sort of kowtow to any kind of group think or anything like that. Uh, so yep. that's part of why it became so, such an apt title. All right, let's give your wife a little more publicity. Uh, what's her name and does she have a writing or editing background as you do? Thank you for saying yes. Her name's Amy, Amy Levine Kennedy. Um, and she does. We went to, uh, years ago, we went to journalism school together at Columbia, yeah. Columbia Graduate School. Um, and she- Columbia? At Columbia, yeah, Columbia yeah. Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, All she right. writes more about art. She's not a baseball writer, um, but she's a great thinker and, and helped me along the way in many ways. Yeah, and certainly helped with the title as well. We're going to break down each of these chapters or parts of the book. Uh, you separated them into 1946, 49, 56, and then his final year, uh, 1972. 1946 was his lone season in the minor leagues. He had played previously for a season in the Negro Leagues with the Kansas City Monarchs. And we now basically look at the Negro Leagues as very much equivalent to the major leagues, the same level, the same thing. But that one season in Montreal has not been all that well publicized. I'm curious, Kostya, when he went to spring training with the Dodgers that year, did he know for sure that he was going to be going to Montreal or did he hold out some hope that he might be promoted to the Dodgers in 46? Well, I think he, he held, uh, he, he knew he was going to Montreal when camp broke. I think there was no question about that. Uh, one thing that I discussed a little bit in the book and, and I hadn't seen it really explored elsewhere so it's of interest to me is the decision not to bring Robinson up uh, in 46. So that for Dodger fans could was tell you that that's the year that they tied for the pennant with the Cardinals and then lost and didn't make it to the World Series. Jackie, mm. 
by August is tearing it up in, in the international league. He is, he is outplaying the league. Uh, he, he could uh, easily have, have made the transition to the major league. And the Dodgers down the stretch had guys like Eddie Mixus hitting. They had, they had uh, you know, marginal players at first base, second base, third base position that Jackie had played, would play, could have, could have seen time at. And it's, it's almost impossible by any analytic measure to not imagine that if Jackie had been on the team, say, the last six weeks of the season, taking some of those at bat, the, the, the Dodgers wouldn't have won one more game. Yeah. Avoided the playoff. Maybe they win the World Series. Maybe the whole, you know, wait till next year type stuff is gone, right? Now they've won in 46. And then, consequently, maybe Robinson, who didn't play that well in the 47 World Series, is that much better in a World yeah. Series spotlight. The, the, it, you know, obviously it's entirely speculative, but uh, you could make a case uh, analytically and from a baseball standpoint that he should have been brought up. Now, I say that, but I'm not critical of the decision at all because of course there was so much more to it in the case of, of, of Robinson, right? Uh, and if he had come up and not played well in the first 10 games, if he had come up and, and cost the, the Dodgers a game because of an error or something like that, the repercussions to the integration of baseball might have been so severe. So it was clearly the right decision uh, to wait till 47. I, I liken a little bit to sometimes people say, you know, the Beatles, they, they should have given George Harrison a little more time to chance to write some more songs. I'm sort of like, well, things work out kind of okay for the Beatles. I think. You don't have to <laughs> debate that. And you don't really have to debate the timing of, of Robinson being called up. Although you couldn't certainly make a case from a baseball standpoint that that it was a lot yeah. to be said from coming up in '46. His final numbers at Montreal were overwhelming. He batted 349. He compiled an OPS combining slugging percentage and um, on base percentage 930, which is remarkable for a middle infielder. Uh, yeah, in retrospect, it looks like uh, he didn't need that season. But I'm also pretty sure, based on what I've read in your book and other books, the Jackie Robinson that began the season at Montreal was a little bit raw and was not quite the finished product that we saw at the end of the year. Correct or incorrect on my part? Absolutely. And, and I, I, think he, I think he did need that year. You know, even if we entertain the debate that maybe he could have left a little early, he needed that year. And look, they needed uh -huh. uh, a year to... But just even personally, right, in 45 uh, or before coming to Montreal, they were living in, in his wife Rachel's uh, girlhood home, right? They, they were around by friends. Now they're out on their own uh, and doing this incredible thing. Again, they, they're the one, he's the one black ball player in an all-white league. They're, they're a, uh, a young black couple living alone in, in a very friendly and welcoming, but all-white neighborhood, primarily French-speaking neighborhood. Uh, they had to get used to being out on their own and being alone and being a level of celebrity isn't easy, right? It, it, I think it, it's where Robinson began to really realize the weight of the expe expectations upon him. He'd certainly, you know, been highlighted as an athlete, uh, the big football star at UCLA, but he hadn't gone out there and had the newspapers writing, you know, he steps into the plate representing all of us, uh, the African-American newspapers would write. And I think he it helped him get ready. And they, they spoke about it, that that year was sort of a, you know, a, a petri dish, a growing area for them to get ready for what would come in the years that follow and sort of give them some strength. Did Jackie or Rachel speak any French at all? No. <laughs> I'm sure they learned how to sort of order things and, and get, get around a little bit, but they did not speak French. And, and then as now... You know, English was, there, there are plenty of people speaking English. You could get away with that. I'm sure mm -hmm. if they had been there much longer, they would have learned more French. But um, no, they didn't, they didn't learn French. What was their apartment like? It was uh, right on a nice leafy street. It actually is a, an avenue called the Gaspe Avenue, as I say, with a sort of French-speaking enclave not far from what was a, an Italian area at that time. Um, uh, you know, a, a nice wooden door, imagine five or six steps going up to the front with a little banister. Uh, not ostentatious by any sense, but perfectly um, comfortable. They had people living above them. Um, and Rachel would sometimes, everybody's very helpful uh, to, uh -huh. to them. 
and the kids would like to they'd see her coming down the street, especially later in the year when she was pregnant. And they'd run and grab her grocery bags and help her bring them home and things like that. And Rachel would leave fruit out in a bowl hmm. um, to the so that so the kids from upstairs could come and come and get them. Uh, it was sort of a, a there was the front that I described, and then in the back was an interior courtyard where everybody had a small little balcony. And that was a place of, of sort of gathering place in the evening where um, people go out on their balconies and talk. It, again, it was a little tough for Rachel. The, the women there were very kind to her and sometimes they shared oh. their ration cards uh, with her. Uh, it was you know, still the aftermath of World War II. And she of course had some time on her own. And very early on, she would go with uh, Jackie on road trips, but that stopped fairly soon. And again, after her pregnancy, um, so she did have some time she spent on her own when the Royals were on the road. I have heard that Jackie and Rachel were generally treated very well, relatively little in terms of racism that might have been much more prevalent in some other areas. Uh, was that truly the case? Was it uh, a fairly racially unified neighborhood? And also, what was the racial atmosphere like at the ballpark, the Lormier Downs? So you have to remember that the the it was not a racially unified neighborhood in the sense that it was basically an all white uh, neighborhood, but there, but there wasn't racial tension on by, by their accounts, and also I I took I was able to speak with African Americans who grew up during that time and could talk to me about Montreal. Then, listen, it was still it was still tough. It wasn't equal. Like uh, uh, African Americans are African Canadians, but. Black workers often worked in labor jobs and had jobs on the railroad, and it was very tough to become, say, a professor or a doctor. It's not to suggest yeah. that it was equal by any stretch. It was a, it was a very difficult for to get opportunity, but there wasn't there was no kind of legal segregation. There was that that black white divide, which was so prevalent and so divisive and harmful in America, wasn't really there. Uh, in in um, in Montreal, it was it, it was more of a divide between French speaking English speaking uh -huh. Catholics and non Catholics um, than the black white issue. Just wasn't didn't have that urgency that it had here. And I and I think again that made it somewhat easier. And at the ballpark, you had there was this one gentleman and man named Ivan Livingstone who called for me. You know, you'd be going to the ballpark. He was an African American. He was a black. Uh, young boy at that point, about 12 years old. And he said, you know, you go to the park and uh, the white fans would look at you like as if you had something to do with it. Like it was your day to celebrate because Jackie was playing there. And he said, well, and you know what? We felt like we did have something to do with it. So mm. there, was a, there was a sense of, um, uh, of, of people coming together. It was still predominantly a Caucasian crowd. It was, it was a much higher population of, of uh, white Montreal and then there were black Montreal uh, and it was the, the French speaking population really loved it baseball um, so there was a lot of French you'd hear people calling out uh, calling out in French and selling their foods in French and things like that and Jackie Jackie actually said something the announcer was French or had kind of a French accent and he liked it because he would say that when he heard the French uh, announcer pronounce his name something like Jackie Robinson <laughs> he liked that because he said I could pretend I was somebody else. I wasn't me for uh, him. It was really indicative of the pressure that he was feeling. Um, that he would uh, found it a way to wear a different a different hat, so to speak. Now this is really interesting to me. There was no Jim Crow segregation in Montreal, nope. so this really is is completely different from what we saw in America, particularly in the American South at this same time. Um, the fans at Delormier Downs treated him pretty well in general. Yeah, so you know they played. They were in the International League as it was called, and most of their games, though, they played uh, against teams in the United States. Their road game. Uh, there was a team in Toronto, but otherwise they came down. They play in Baltimore, Syracuse, uh, Rochester, places like that. And at the end of that season, when uh, they they played in what was called the Little World Series, which was basically the minor league World Series, and the Montreal Royals played a team from a different league, the Louisville Colonels. And they went down to Louisville that late that year, late September, early October. And it was it was really tough for Robinson. Oh. There, there, there were Jim Crow stands, segregated stands, uh, with poor conditions for black 
spectators and Jackie really was vilified by the heard the worst thing you know really the worst he had heard in his time in the league he didn't play well in those few games um and was really unnerved and when they got back up to Delormier Downs uh those fans never booed the opposition very very rare it was like more more St. Louis than Philadelphia let's put it that way um but when the colonels came up they had heard and read about the treatment that Jackie got and those fans in Delorme down just booed every Colonel player who came up. Wow. Uh, name everything, in sort of a show of solidarity. And Jackie would talk about how that, you know, he felt like they have my back. Um, and they really did, you know. And, and P- I said, I, I mentioned, I spoke to some um, Black uh, people who were living in, in Montreal at the time. I also spoke to, to many Caucasian people living in Montreal at the time who, who loved Jackie Robinson. I mean, he was so exciting and appealing. And just from a baseball standpoint, how could you, how could you not adore watching him and being around him as a fan? Asha, here we have on the screen a great vintage photograph from that season. Uh, I'm not really sure if this is Montreal, if this is Delormier Downs, or if it's a road game, but I'm amazed by the size of the crowd here. I mean, this is, it looks like a packed house. Do you know if this is Montreal or if this is a road game? It's April 16th, 1946. We're in Jersey City uh, at Roosevelt Stadium, and they're playing the Jersey City Giants. Uh, and the game had taken place right about this time of year, of course. So it, uh, a lot of kids are off for, uh, I think it was Maundy Thursday. So kids are off for, for Passover holiday or for Easter holiday. And, oh. and it's a huge crowd. And, and this was, it was minor league baseball, but this game had the feel and the uh, atmosphere of a major league game. And that was because of Robinson. And, and it was African-American newspapers were covering it like anything. It's a very mixed crowd. I don't know how well we can see that in the picture, but it was. Um, and this picture is after his second at bat, uh, Robinson hits a three-run homer. He had an extraordinary day that day, and uh, people began to see him dancing off third base where he'd become famous. This is the very uh-huh. start of it. This is their first game of the year. And he comes around and here's George Shuba, George Shotgun Shuba, who would go on to play for the Dodgers, who went and shook his hand when he came across the plate. And it had become there's actually a statue that just went up in, in Youngstown, Ohio at this very moment. Um, it's become a symbolic moment, and it is, although Schuber would say, and in this way, it makes it even more powerful, you know, he didn't think much of it, that there was a, a white man going to shake a black man's hand. Uh, his teammate hit a home run, and when that happens, you go up and you shake his hand, and way to go, man. And, yeah. And that's what happened, that it was that simple. Um, and it's a very powerful picture, and it was, this was the, one of the extraordinary days in Robinson's life as he began the, the journey ahead. So this is Jersey City? Yep. And that's George Shuba uh, shaking uh, Jackie's hand and he completes the circuit around the bases. Was this indicative that his players or his teammates really did support him, were on the same page with him? For the most part, yes. Uh, There was, you know, uh, you can't paint everything with a single brush. But for the most part, I mean, the thing was, once you played with or were around Robinson, it was pretty hard not to respect him. I mean, yeah. simply because because of his skill and also because of his commitment and the way he went about things, uh, he was so so he quickly won the respect of of anybody who might not have had it. And and again, somebody like George Shuba, he was a religious person, or you know, his values were not. Uh, he grew up in Ohio, so he wasn't necessarily around. He wasn't from the South, um, yeah. and they they didn't necessarily overthink it that much, Bruce. You know, it was like yeah. he, he he's on my team and. Yeah, let's go. Let's go beat the other guys. Gosh, one final question on that season in Montreal. His manager was a man named Clay Hopper. How did they get along? Well, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. You know, uh, Hopper in the in, in spring training had some, you know, would use the worst kind of language about black people and say, oh, he didn't even think they were human beings. Um, and, and he was a Southerner who w- w- didn't like very much the task he had uh, of, of, of integrating or having Robinson on his team. Branch Rickey didn't leave him any choice. Um, but Robinson won Hopper over. Now we'll never know what was in, in Hopper's heart, how much he would change or not, but outwardly, basically what I was just saying, like the, the respect that Hopper had after being around Jackie Robinson for a few weeks, just transformed everything. He saw the kind of player mm-hmm. he was. He saw that Jackie would get 
have a ball thrown at his head, have have one thrown at his chest, and get up and and hit a double down the line, and that's just one hopper over. He later became a big ally, and Robinson, as was his nature, kind of forgave him the prejudice that he came into the situation with, and and didn't hold him as accountable for it. So attributed to his, you know, upbringing and his surrounding. And Hopper would then really be an ally. Sometimes he would come and take when the crowd was around, sort of almost suffocating uh, Robinson after games. Often it was Hopper who would sort of come through and take him by the hand and, and bring him back to the locker room where Jackie wanted to go. Um, so a very interesting relationship and, and very indicative of the impact that Jackie could have on others. You know, I think this is interesting. It's not to make Hopper out to be a saint because he apparently said some awful things in the early days of the season, but at least he did come around. Whereas other people like Ben Chapman never did, even when they saw what a great player Jackie Robinson was, you know, there was always a but, or, you know, there was always some excuse not to like Jackie or to try to put Jackie down. So at least Hopper did evolve somewhat. Yep. There's no question about it. He does seem to have evolved. And again, I say you take the cue a little bit from Robinson who saw that evolution and was willing to, to, you know, more or less forgive him or more or less, you know, accept him and, and often credit him, you know, he thanked Hopper for, for doing this, what I just described, sort of rescuing him from the yeah. actual of the fan. So, yeah, he, that, that's fair to say, Bruce. Yeah, Jackie showed a lot of guts. You know, he shows up as manager, not the most enlightened guy, and yet he did not allow that to uh, discourage him, did not allow that to make him think about quitting. He just kept playing and eventually did win Hopper over. All right, the second season that you highlight in your terrific book is the 1949 season. So this is Jackie's third year with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, he ends up having a great year. We're going to run the numbers at you in a moment. But Costa, do you believe that one of the reasons he played so much better that year is that he simply felt more accepted and therefore more comfortable, not to say that the racism had ended, but do you think it was a situation where by year three, he maybe feels like a true Dodger after all? Well, I think uh, not exactly that, but but it's but it's related to it in that his first two seasons as a Dodger, uh, as had been said, he would he would sort of turn the other cheek and he he muted his reaction and muted his game a little bit. No, no player in baseball in 47 and 48 was hit with a pitch more often than Jackie Robinson. And when he would get hit with a pitch, he'd, you know sit up, brush off the dirt off his pants and jog down to first base. Uh, and he and he would, you know, sort of took it, so to speak, before the 1949 season. And here is where, yeah, now he does feel a little more secure. He won rookie of the year's first year, had a solid year the second year, but he just decided he couldn't do that anymore. And he said in spring training, you know, they better be rough on me this year because I'm going to be rough on them. And uh -huh. he came out in 1949 and he played – with an abandoned characteristic of his earlier years, when he was in the Negro Leagues, uh, I, I quote, quoted somebody from a teammate, Othello Renfro, who said that Robinson was, quote, up to his neck in every game. Uh, mm. And he played really hard and, and was a vocal player out there. And that's what he did in 1949. And it made all the difference. Now you are seeing him as a much more enlivened, sort of man in full type player, wow. engaged, taunting when you know not gratuitous but he just didn't take it and he and he gave as good as he got and he went from being an excellent player to being the best baseball player alive to winning mvp and even by today's metrics of you know wins above replacement and everything he was clearly the best player in baseball uh so it was a huge shift that year branch ricky and the dodger administration they fully supported this change Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Jackie said it. He, he, basically, um, Jackie said to, to Branch Rickey, it's time. And Branch Rickey said, OK, uh, yeah. he was fully supported. And at that point, the Dodger organization pretty much was Branch Rickey. If he was on board, everybody was on board, period. And that changed pretty quickly in a couple of years after that. But in 49, that was still the case. Now, his manager that year, 1949, was a guy named Bert Schotten, who's not uh, – a brand name and managing history, not that well known. Schotten had managed, I believe, parts of the 47 and 48 season, but in 49, he's the full-time manager. He's there from start to finish. Yep. What was the relationship like between Schotten and Robinson? 
Uh, it, it was good. I mean, I think that he had a, he had a perfectly good relationship with, with Sean and he liked him. Um, it, Robinson did not get along with, with Walt Alston, the, the manager who succeeded Sean, but he had, he had a good relationship with, uh, with Bert Sean. Oh. Why did he not get along with Alston? Uh, I think Alston, honestly, I don't know if he respected Alston so much, even though Alston went on to win four world series, including the one in 55 in Brooklyn and three more in LA. Um, uh, he, he didn't think that Austin used his players as well as he could have. He didn't have a certain affinity um, mm. for him. He, there, there was a moment, I think also that Austin didn't quite, and whether he should have or not, it, I leave open. I'm not saying, pass me no judgment on it, but he didn't sort of recognize or honor just how critical a figure, Jack Robinson was the most important player in Dodger history that year and every year since, period. And he was the reason why the Dodgers were as good as they were. Obviously, there were other good players, but they, they wouldn't have been Campanella on the team. There wouldn't have been Newcomb or Jim Gilliam, right? Um, so the reason that the Dodgers were at that at the level they played in from the late 40s to the late 50s was most attributable to Robinson. Obviously, others played a very important part. There's, this is just one example, but it'll show something. In 1954, they're playing a game in Wrigley Field, and Snyder, Duke Snyder, hits the ball that uh, looks like it clears the wall, um, goes into like the netting or the little sort of uh, metallic screen, I think it was at that point, over hmm. the wall, comes back onto the field, the umpires rule it a double. Robinson, as with his nature, goes running out to start arguing about it. Austin, who's in the third base box, doesn't even come over to support it. Hmm. Later, Austin says, oh, well, we thought it was clearly a home run. I didn't think Jackie was right. So, but that's no... He's your best player. <laughs> He's your, yeah. You know, go over and stand with him. And he didn't. And it, it happened that photographs later showed in the paper that Robinson was actually right. It was a double. That's almost immaterial. There wasn't the sort of closeness and affinity um, that that Robinson had hoped for and wanted as, uh, in a manager. I love this photograph here, uh, Jackie being presented with the MVP award. I assume this actually happened the following year, 1950. And I believe that's Ford Frick, uh, the uh, president of the, uh, well, no, wait a minute. He uh, was president of the American League. Uh, I'm not sure. Who is that giving him the I'm, award? I'm also not sure. It's funny. He, he looks a little like, uh, it, 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 he looks a little like Landis. He looks a little like Schott. And I'm not sure. It's definitely not Kenzo Mount Landis. I'm just saying he's yeah. that, that, kind of, that kind of sculpted features. Look, I'm not familiar with this picture, Bruce. I'm not sure oh, okay. exactly who it is. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd assumed it was Frick, but uh, uh, Frick was the American League president, so that doesn't make any sense. We'll have to we'll have to mm -hmm. figure out exactly who that was, uh, but this apparently was a a night game at Ebbets Field, probably early in the 1950 season. Uh, here we've got another photo of Jackie posing with that 1949 Most Valuable Player award, and as you know, Kostya, the numbers that he put up were incredible. Now he's 30 years of age. And baseball analysts today say, really, your prime was when you're 27, 28, maybe 29. By the time you hit 30, you're actually starting to go downhill. Not so for Jackie. He bats 342. He slugs 524. He drove in 124 runs, stole 37 bases. He's doing this as a middle infielder. He's the everyday second baseman. He's putting up numbers like a corner outfield. I mean, just... To watch him play in 1949 must have been the most dynamic sight in all of baseball. So that year, uh, Robinson batted over, as you just said, he batted over 340. Uh, he stole more than 35 bases. He had more than 65 extra base hits. And now I'm going to list all the other players who've done that since then in the next 75 years. <laughs> done. That's it. Nobody's Zero. done it since. Yeah, uh, he was the best player alive in terms of 30 versus 28 and all that. His trajectory was a little different uh, just in that he didn't get a start until uh, he, until he was 28. He didn't break into yeah. his career was shorter in the back end. Same same token. He didn't have quite maybe the mileage on him at 30 that somebody who'd come in at 24 might have had. So uh, he was clearly in his prime. Then if you look at the next few years. 49 was his single best year. Uh, 53 was a, a huge year. And, and, and th that, th that core of his career was beyond all-star. It was elite level, um, clearly Hall of Fame worthy uh, years throughout the, the heart of his career.
Yeah, I mean, the numbers that he put up that year were reminiscent of past second basemen like Rogers Hornsby, future second baseman like Joe Morgan, one of the best players I ever had the privilege of watching. Uh, I mean, what he accomplished as a second baseman that year was phenomenal. May not have just been the MVP in the National League. He may have been the best player in baseball, period. And it is pretty remarkable that he had, had already turned 30. You know, he did get this late start because of the color barrier and maybe less or so because of the war. Uh, but just amazing, the numbers that he put up in 1949. We'll jump ahead, Kostya, to the third season that you profiled, the 1956 season. And here we see Jackie right off the bat physically starts to look a lot different. Uh, he's quite a bit heavier. He is uh, thicker. Um, he doesn't look like, um, you know, the same maybe spry athletic. I mean, he was always muscular, but he doesn't look quite as spry, quite as athletic. And yet, even though this is his final season, it was a bounce back for year for him after a very poor 1955. He finishes 16th in the National League MVP voting. And he's kind of the super utility man. He doesn't play every day, but he fills in all over the infield and outfield and really puts up great numbers or, or very solid numbers. Uh, pretty remarkable what he did at an advanced age. No question. And if you look at the, the, the big stretch of the summer when the pennant was really being sort of sussed out between the Dodgers and the Braves when Jackie uh, hitting well over 300 and had a, had a long stretch of about 150 at-bats where he was they were headlines sort of like Robinson throws back the clock um, after he'd steal a couple bases and things like that. He, he flat out beat the Braves in two key games. Uh, I want to say late August, maybe early September. Um, no, he was a crucial player. You can see, as you mentioned, he did have physical, he wasn't as agile as he was. He put, he put on some weight um, and he didn't play uh, as many games. He still played the majority of games, but if you look at the team's record, when he was in the lineup and when he was not, it's a pretty plain um, indication. I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head. I did include it in the book, but he was clearly uh, a, the difference maker. And they're not getting into the World Series without him. Uh, it's, it's that yeah. Time. Did he know at all going into that season that this was going to be the swan song? Or was that still very much up in the air? No, I think he, I mean... You know, he, 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 I think he had a good feeling, good, good sense that this was it. You know, he, his body was not where it, it he wanted it to be. Uh, he, he was, he was struggling in that sense. And yeah, I think he, he was looking towards the end. And, you know, and, and Robinson, after he left baseball from a playing standpoint, he didn't show any sort of, oh, I wish I was still playing. He, he left it behind. He knew it was time and, and, and that was it. What about the diagnosis of diabetes? Did that come after his playing days? It came after his playing days. It's very reasonable to assume that some of the early symptoms were, were manifest uh, mm. it, it, during while he was still playing. But uh, the official revelation that he had diabetes came soon after, um, in, in, in 1957, not, not long after his retirement. Just to go back a moment, uh, one of our faithful uh, watchers, David Mariah, points out that Frick was president of, of the National League in um, uh, 1950 when that presentation was made. So that was indeed Ford Frick in that photograph. Um, one other person, Martin Brody, another one of our faithful participants, wants to know a little bit more about what happened after this 1956 season when Jackie was traded to the Giants, but he ended up not reporting. He ended up retiring. What insights can you give us into that entire episode? Was there ever any chance that he would play for New York Giants? I mean, I think there was a slim, slim chance. What, what, what happened actually is that shortly after the World Series, um, Robinson, as, as I was saying, he knew it was time to move on. He had taken it. He decided to retire and he'd taken a job as a, as a vice president with chock full of nuts. That would be the job that he moved into. Um, and he, but he had not announced his retirement yet because he promised uh, Look Magazine that he would have an exclusive, he would reveal it exclusively in their pages. And there was a lag time between when he said that and when the magazine was put together and printed out of, of a number of weeks. And in that interim is when the Dodgers traded him to the Giants. 
And Jackie just simply didn't tell anybody so much to the point that photographers came up to his, their home in Stamford, Connecticut, and he and Jackie Jr. posed with giant pennants. Um, he, he talks about, Robinson talked about the team. He got a telegram from Willie Mays welcoming him to the team. Uh, and then uh, soon after, uh, the Look Magazine article drops, is about to drop, and he makes it official. He sends a letter to Horace Stoneham of the Giants. And he goes public and says he's not going to sign a report. Dodger fans, of course, assume, yeah, he'd rather retire than have to play for the Giants. Um, and, and they love it and let them keep that belief and that that's just fine. But uh, the, the truth was a little more complicated, but still, yeah. he, he ended up not playing for the rival Giants. Was he upset at all that the Dodgers had traded him? Yep. I think there's no question that was part of his break from from Walter O'Malley, uh, he didn't think it was it was <laughs> the right thing. I mean, look, if you if you looked at it purely objectively, uh, a player of his age, diminished productivity, uh, w but still still pro productive, was a, mm -hmm. was a prime candidate to be traded, right? Mm -hmm. Except for this Jackie Robinson, right? So what are you doing trading Jackie Robinson and and not only trading him but to the rival? It's not as bad as trading him to the Yankees. That would have been beyond the pale for a uh, a Dodger fan, but to the Giants was bad enough. So, uh, yeah, no, it, he de it definitely bothered Jackie. And uh, even though he said it didn't, even years later, he would come back and, and say how much that had hurt him. No, if I'm the Dodgers, I would have kept him as well as he had played in that final season in 56, his versatility. You could use him all over the field. I mean, to me, that, that would have been valuable, but uh, obviously uh, they felt differently. Let's advance now to the final year of Jackie's life, 1972. Here is a photograph of, of Jackie, very contemplative, uh, hair almost completely turned gray. You can't really tell in the uh, photograph, but he put quite a, a bit of weight on. There's been a lot of speculation or discussion about what his health was like during that final year. Uh, was it as poor as some people have made it out to be? Well, he was really struggling. He, his, his eyesight was also had gotten really, really poor. He could, couldn't see that well. Um, and yeah, he struggled. He had circulation issues. Um, and I, I think that some of the confusion around it is that despite that, Robinson didn't really stop doing things. He continued to engage um, in, in public settings. He continued to, to work. Um, and so, you know, when he died in, in, October, it was, it was a big shock for people who were who were from afar um, because they would just seen him out there. They'd seen him out at the World Series and, and hearing his name and seeing him, oh my God, now at 53, he died. But people who saw him more recently was, of course, a terrible shock and terribly sad, yeah. but not quite the, the uh, not quite as out of the blue when Jackie went to Dodger Stadium his first time back in a baseball stadium in 15 years. He went out to Los Angeles that summer, and there was an event in which he was he was among others being honored, and he spoke on the field. And Campanella was there that that time oh. and saw him. And Campanella is a guy who said to Jackie Robinson, certainly not only Campanella, but other people said Jackie Robinson, the greatest athlete I ever saw. So he was not only a great baseball player, but as we know, he played football and was in baseball circles. He was known as this great athlete. And about a week after that event, Campanella was talking about it and breaks down crying and says, you know, the, the physics, because of the physical condition that Robinson was in, he said, you know, just goes to show what the years can do to you. So it was quite a shock for people who hadn't seen him for some time, the point to which he had deteriorated, even though he kept sort of his... Um, he kept a strong attitude and he kept uh, pushing himself right to the very, very end. His last public appearance came at the World Series that October. He appeared prior to game two in Cincinnati Riverfront Stadium, Reds versus the A's. Here we see the picture of Jackie, who um, was almost blind at this point in time. He's throwing out the first pitch. Uh, he's next to the commissioner, Bowie Kuhn. Curious about their relationship. Uh, how did Jackie and Bowie Kuhn get along? It wasn't, it was, it was, it, as far as my awareness of it, it was neither here nor there, really. Um, Bowie Kuhn had to kind of be talked into and made to understand how good it would be to have Jackie come back um, and be part of the game here at this World Series. But once, once that was, 
sort of explained to him and he was on board. Um, and he, and he was very gracious towards Robinson and uh, th- there was not a point of engagement or friction uh, with yeah. Kuhn per se at all. Uh, and, and Robinson, you know, he was somebody who wasn't afraid to criticize the system, but at the same time worked within the system um, and, and paid deference to the way things were set up. So they had a perfectly good working relationship. They weren't particularly close. They didn't do all that much together. You're not gonna find a lot of other pictures that have both Bowie Kuhn and yeah. Jack Robinson in them unless it's from this day. It certainly made sense to honor Robinson that fall. It was the 25th anniversary of his breaking of the color barrier. Absolutely. The 25 years uh, that, that fall, you say, and he'd also been very active. The reason why Jackie agreed to do it was that they agreed to make donations to drug rehabilitation centers. And, and that was very near to the near and dear to the Robinsons. So they'd lost their, their son, Jackie Jr., not through drugs, but he had had a, a drug problem earlier in his, in his mm. life. Um, and so that's, that was, he was being cited, Robinson was also being cited for his work on behalf of drug rehabilitation, and that was, that was critical for Robinson to agree to do it. At this final public appearance, Jackie makes a point of saying that he wanted to see a black face managing a team. He felt that was the next obstacle to be overcome almost as if he knew this this might have been it for him. This might have been his last chance to have the public forum. I might be reading too much into that, but I just get the sense that he felt the end was near. He needed to make a statement. You agree? I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I don't know that he knew that he would, he would pass away less than 10 days later, but he referred to this and one other slightly earlier event as the last hurrah. Um, and he went there and he... You know, it's very, it's almost classic Robinson. He got up there and Pee Wee Reese was, was behind him and he very graciously talked about Pee Wee Reese, the captain who made it all possible, how he couldn't, he, Robinson, could not have done it without the support and help of his teammate. He cited Branch Rickey and thanked Branch Rickey. He was very gracious towards baseball. And then in his very last sentence is when he said, but I'll be even more proud and more pleased when I see a black face manager. Um, he did not miss an opportunity to agitate for progress. Mm-hmm. Nor did he miss an opportunity to give credit where he felt it was due. He was very generous in that way. And uh, it, was, it was very classic Robinson. As he's coming off the field, Joe Morgan, who you mentioned earlier, ran over and shook his hand uh, as he was leaving the field. Yeah. I had a chance to speak with Morgan many years later. Of course, he's now no longer with us as well. But um, And he spoke about what an important moment that was for him and, and how much he wanted to have that opportunity to meet Jackie Robinson. We have a couple of moments uh, remaining with Costa Kennedy. He's been terrific over this past hour. Speaking of Joe Morgan, you mentioned that you did interview him. You talked to Rachel Robinson at one point. Was there any one person in particular that was a favorite interview for you that really provided tremendous insight into Jackie's character? Honestly, Bruce, there, there was a lot of people in, in, who, who gave a lot of different things. So um, th- those people were both very, very helpful. I had a great conversation with Carl Erskine. Yeah. Um, well, some of the people in, in Montreal who I mentioned earlier, um, Omar Livingston and others. Um, Bob Aspamonte gave me some wonderful stuff. Who was just a young kid coming up in, in Jackie's last year. But uh, that was very helpful. And I, I had a, uh, some really strong conversations with um, Ira Glasser, who is not in baseball, but he grew up in Brooklyn um, uh, and was 10 years old in 1949 and went on to become head of the American Civil Liberties Union for 25 years um, oh. and attributes that to the fact that he had grown up with the privilege of seeing Jackie Robinson play. Uh, and he, he represents a lot of other young people who Jackie made that impact on. Uh, in Brooklyn and in the country in those years. Final question for Kostya Kennedy. You know, we do a lot of educational programs here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, Our most popular is our civil rights program. It gets uh, requested all the time. Not only do we talk about Jackie Robinson, we talk about other black baseball pioneers, Bud Fowler, Moses Fleetwood Walker, Rube Foster, Satchel Paige. But obviously it all all comes back to Robinson. Here we see him with some kids. I'm curious what you feel Jackie's legacy might be with children today. They obviously never saw him play. Um, There's relatively little videotape. 
Uh, you know, he's a player whose career goes back decades. So in some ways, he can be a distant figure to younger people. But what do you think Robinson's legacy could be with the youth of 2020, 2022? I mean, I think that what I described there a little bit of, of, of stand up for what's right and fight for fight for your standards and your beliefs. Do you can you can still do that in a respectful way? That doesn't mean you have to be patient. It doesn't mean you have to accept things. It means push as hard as you want, uh, but push in a way that people at least have an opportunity to receive. And I think that that would be a message that he would he would lead. Uh, I, I do think, and you make a good point that the fact that Robinson's approach in the civil rights arena in the way he spoke is very analogous to, to the way he was an, as an athlete. That athlete embodied the man. And for people I mentioned earlier, just, just a moment ago, young kids growing up watching Robinson, what that taught them, is just simply more than, than kids, especially younger kids, are gonna learn from a history book. Um, so, so they won't get quite that. They won't get that visceral lead by example, show them. But I do think that a lot can be absorbed. And, and the Jackie Robinson Foundation and the Jackie Robinson Museum, which is opening in uh, this year in, in downtown New York are places uh, where real learning can can be had and, and, and interesting learning, I think, even for young people. Do you know when that museum is opening? Uh, it's scheduled to open in July, mm. uh, and it's down right where the foundation is uh, on, on Barrack Street and on the west side of Lower Manhattan. And of course, tomorrow, April 15th, will be a 75th anniversary of Jackie's breaking the color barrier, the color line. Jackie Robinson Day will be celebrated throughout Major League Baseball, but also celebrated here at the Hall of Fame with a number of programs on site in our museum. The book is terrific. True the Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson, uh, Kostya Kennedy, the author, published by St. Martin's. I actually have an advanced reader copy here, but I'm looking forward to seeing the, the completely finished product. Um, I'm told that when the, the finished product has to, comes out, I have to throw out the reader copy because it might have some mistakes in it, but maybe I'll keep it as a collectible. Uh, I, what I've read has been terrific, and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the, the final finished product. It is available uh, at our website, shop.baseballhall.org forward slash true. The reviews so far have been excellent. The book is brand new from St. Martin's. Kasia, this has been great. Um, I learned a lot about Jackie Robinson. Uh, tremendous insights that you've given us. It's been my pleasure and, and a privilege to be able to talk about it with you. So thanks very much for having me, Bruce. Well, we thank uh, Kasia Kennedy for being with us today for the virtual author series. We thank all of you for watching and listening as well. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.